reasons it makes sense to praise God. That's what I want to share with us this morning. What are the reasons why we ought to praise God? Now, we may not ask that kind of a question when God has recently done something for us. Maybe God has just answered a prayer or God has blessed you in a way that is beyond your imagination. Your reason is right there. God just provided me a great job. God just blessed me uh, with a house or whatever. But there are times that those things may not have happened and the Bible still say, praise God, be excited, rejoice in the Lord. At those times, what will be the reasons to praise God? You see, because in the Bible, there is never a condition that we are given upon which we should, we should praise God. And when those conditions are absent, we should cease praising God. All through the scriptures, you are commanded to rejoice in the Lord. All through the scriptures, you are commanded to praise the living God. Even when your situation is down, the Bible says praise God. Even when you feel like not saying anything to anybody, the Bible says rejoice and be excited in God. But then the question is, have you asked yourself, well, I don't really feel like praising God right now. Why should I praise God? So I want to just share a few reasons with you this morning. Why when you are praying and maybe something might not be going well or your prayer, the answer to your prayer is still pending, that thing you are expecting hasn't come yet and God says, praise me anyway. We praise God for other reasons beyond what he has done for us but who he is and his ability. Turn your scriptures with me to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Let's see what the first few verses of this psalm say. Starting from verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with a harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. This is what I'm talking about. This passage tells you, rejoice, jump up, even shout. But you're going, well, I could shout if God had answered my prayer, but he hasn't yet. I don't know if anybody is following me this morning. I said, well, maybe David was writing this only at the time God has just done something for him. No. He tells you the reason. Let's look on. Rejoice, bless God, praise the Lord. Why? Number one, verse four. For the word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in truth or faithfulness. The number one reason we are given here, when God has not recently handed you a check when god has not recently answered a long time prayer the number one reason you are giving to praise god anyway is because god is morally good because he is good even at bad times let's let's look into it the first thing you see about god being good is the word of the lord is right and all his work is done in faithfulness. This means that when God speaks, his word is upright. The word right there is the, the, word, the Hebrew word yasa, which means it's straight. This is telling us that the kind of God that you and I serve, regardless of the situation we might find ourselves, is the God that when he speaks, his word is straight. There, there are no bends. There are no curves. There is no deception in who God is. So morally speaking, God deserves to be praised because he's an upright God. God is a God that cannot lie. God is a God that cannot deceive you. God is a God that whatever he speaks is true. There is no deception in him. And the Bible says, therefore, he's separate from human being. You ought to praise him for who he is. And who he is is his word, his truth. And his works are done in faithfulness. Look at a few other passages regarding this. Psalm 12 verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. Like silver tried in a furnace of the earth, 
purified seven times. Purified seven times. His word, you can count on his word. Psalm 18 verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. The word, whatever the Lord says, you can count on it. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says this. In hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Verse 2. God who cannot lie. So, God, the Bible is telling us that you may be in certain situations when God says, praise me anyway, the reason God is telling you to praise him is that God says, if I say something to you, you can take it to the bank, regardless of what may be happening around you. Because his word is like silver purified seven times. Because his word is proven and there is no unfaithfulness in his word. The second thing he says is, not only his word, but his dealings, his actions is full of faithfulness. That means God is trustworthy. God is reliable. God is dependable. There is no uncertainty in God. So in that verse, Psalm 33, for the word of the Lord is right and all his work is in truth or in faithfulness. Listen to what uh, Lamentation chapter 3 verse 22 says. Through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed because his compassion fails not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. The faithfulness of God is great. You know what that means? It means that you can rely on God at all times, the good and the bad time you can rely on him because he's a faithful God. Somebody listening to me. And so, when God says, you should praise me, even when things look otherwise, God is telling you that you can securely trust him. You can securely put your hope in him because he cannot lie. There's no way he's going to lie to you. Number two, you can count on him because he's a faithful God. In spite of the circumstance, you might find yourself. So, if anything is telling you, in your life, maybe currently right now, based on the circumstances, if something is telling you that maybe God has forgotten you, God is saying, no, no, no. If you know my word, you will realize, I said, my word is true and my faithfulness is to all generation. If the devil is speaking to you because of the circumstances around you and saying, well, maybe God has forgotten you, God says, no, you go back to my word. The devil is only trying to deceive you and put fear in your heart. But when you know that the God you are dealing with is not a man to let you down, then you have confidence to praise him. The reason David was able to praise God all the time is, be is not because he was never in challenging situations, but he knows that the God that he serves can never let him down. Do you know that? The reason the, we cannot praise God at times is because the devil fills our heart and our mind with all these thoughts. What if God doesn't come through? What if God doesn't, you know, God just bails out on you? What if God lets you down? God says, no, 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 no. no. Your confidence, you will get it back the moment you remember that my word is true. The moment you remember that my faithfulness is to all generations. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. When that knowledge enters into your mind, even in bad circumstances, you can still jump up and praise God. Why? Because you are confident in God. Amen. Is somebody listening to me? Amen. So that's why the Bible says you should praise him anyway, no matter what is going on. Look at Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. That is the passage that I just uh, uh, cited to you. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should repent. Praise the Lord. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Has he spoken and will he not make it good? That is the God that we serve. And so you know what? Whether the conditions are good or bad, God says, remember, 
I am not like you. Whatever I say, I mean to do it. Now you may say, but pastor, I've been waiting on the promises of God for a long time. Why haven't they come true if God is faithful? Well, do you remember a man by the name of Joseph in the Bible? Anybody remember the story of Joseph? Joseph, the Bible says, at age 17, he had a dream. And the dream was he was going to be great. He was going to be greater than his brothers. And what did he do? So he came. Joseph was the second to the last uh, of the sons of Jacob. He had 12. Joseph was number 11. And so Joseph came to his brethren and he said, well, I mean, I'm young, but I just got to tell you the dream I have. I saw that we were in the field, and everybody had a stack of their sheep, and my sheep stood, and all your sheep bowed down to my sheep. And they look at him and say, so you are meaning that you are going to be above us? Then he had another dream. This time he said, I saw the sun and the moon. They were all bowing to me. I mean, how? If, the, if a person is in his right mind, how do you have that kind of a dream and even have the guts to say it? But this guy was excited. You know why? Because it was God that gave him that dream. And he didn't know anything that could stop that dream. But what happened? Instead of this dream coming to pass, the whole world turned upside down for Joseph. Look at Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. I'm going to read verse 10. So he told it, that is this dream, he told this to his father and his brothers, and his fathers rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? This is too big of a dream, too lofty. You are out of your mind. There are sometimes, you know, you have some things in your heart and some promises of God you are believing for, and even yourself, you are telling yourself, I must be out of my mind. There's no way this is going to come to pass. Jacob, even though he was a man of faith, he said, shut up, Joseph. What are you talking about? You mean me and your mother will bow down for you too? I can understand if your brothers will bow down for you, but not us. And so what happened? The Bible says, instead of his dream coming to pass at age 17, the Bible tells us that two things befell him. The brothers, what did they do? They ganged up together and said, let's get rid of this dreamer. So from being the favorite of the house, at least of the father, they sold him to slavery. That doesn't look like his dream. From slavery in Egypt, he wound up in prison. For several years, that doesn't look like his dream. Has God failed? Did God not give the dream? Was the plan messed up because he said something? Well, if you know the story, you know that that was not the case. Look at Genesis chapter 41. God was faithful to his word regardless of becoming a prisoner and a slave. Genesis chapter 41 verse, verse 46. The Bible says, when God will bring out his act... Joseph became the second in command in Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out of from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. When you read the rest of the story because of our time, this man, somehow God got him out of the prison all the way to the highest position in the land of Egypt. But here's what I want you to take, pay attention to. Joseph was 17 when he had the dream, Genesis 35. Did you notice how old he was here? How old? Remove 17 from 30. How, how many years do you have? 13 years, everything was going down. Everything, he went from being taken care of, having the coat of many color. He, he went to a foreign land as a slave. From there, you know, he was managing well in the house of, out of Potiphar, and something bad happened. He went to be the prisoner of the king, and he was forgotten. All kinds of things happened for 13 years. But back to what I'm saying, God said, I am not a man that I should lie. After 13 years of adversity, the dream came through. Why? Because God's word is upright. 
Why? Because God is a faithful God. I want to tell you something. If God has a plan for you, let all hell break loose. Once you can know that God is a faithful God, the word of God is going to stand. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. I want to tell you, if the devil has been telling you, well, maybe, maybe you better find something to do about your situation. Remind the devil that the Bible says the word of God is like silver tried seven times. Remind yourself that the Bible says his faithfulness is great. It's from one generation to the other generation. Remind yourself that if he stood by Joseph when everybody turned against him, he's beside you. That is why he said that you may be in the prison, you may be in the dungeon financially, in your relationship might be all of a mess, everything might be going exactly the opposite of what God told you. Don't move an inch. Because God is a faithful God. So, that's why you can praise God even when nothing is happening. Are you listening to me? You can praise God when nothing is happening. Even when the opposite of what is expected is happening, God says, still praise me anyway because I'm a faithful God. Hallelujah. No matter what you're going through in your life, God is a faithful God. Don't let the devil put fear in your heart. The second reason it makes sense to praise God is because he's the creator and the manager of the entire universe. He created everything that you see everything and he still manages everything there is no change of management since god has created the world listen to it. let's go back to psalm 33 right there uh in verse 6 see what it says verse 6 it says by the word of the lord the heavens were made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and he stood fast. What the Bible is saying is remember that everything you see, the stars, the galaxies, the hosts of heavens came to existence by the word of the Lord. Everything you see, what, everywhere, the space and outer space, the Bible says, they came by the breath of his mouth. Everything you see up there and down here came into existence because this same God decreed them. That's what the Bible is telling us. Now, in, in Isaiah 40, let's look at that passage. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25. God makes the claim about creating all the stars. He said, I made everything. Verse 25, Isaiah 40. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high. And see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might. And the strength of his power. Not one is missing. That is the power of God. Do you know how many stars are in the universe? Nobody knows. But here is, here is some information. This is according to the University of California, Santa Barbara website. There are about 10 billion galaxies observable in the universe. That means that's what they can see. 10 billion galaxies. Now, the number of stars in galaxies vary but assuming an average of 100 billion stars per galaxy, that means there are about 1 billion trillion stars in the universe. 1 billion trillion stars in the universe. And guess what? Isaiah chapter 40, God said, I created every single one of them and I know them by name. And none of them is missing. That's why God says, you can go ahead and praise me <laughs> because I'm pretty powerful. Are you listening to me? And so, you, 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 when you now look at it, you, I don't think your problem is up to one billion items. 
And guess what? God says, the stars are not colliding. The galaxies are not missing. All of them are managing their rotation and everything. All of them at the same time that are managing the earth. I am a great manager, God says. So you can praise him regardless of your situation because when you look at the stars, in fact, you know what? There was a man in the Bible. God told him, God said, lift up your eyes and look at the stars. His name is Abraham. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 to 6. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 to 6. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. <laughs> Obviously, God said, God knows he cannot number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted into it for him for righteousness. God told Abraham, I want you to look. Let's do some exercise. Because we're comparing your situation with my power. God said, okay, all right, let me give you a frame of reference. Look at the stars and see if you can number them. If you cannot number them, Abraham, that is how your children will be. They will be numberless. Let me ask you a question. You know how many children this man had at this time? <laughs> God was telling a barren man that his children will be like the stars of heaven, and the guy is already 100 years old. I mean, if you're going to have like 10 children, you should have started many years ago. But God said, your descendant will have, they will be like that. He is able to do whatever he promises, he can deliver it. At this time in Abraham's life, he, he, he had been trusting the Lord, but you know, nothing is coming forward. And then Agar had said, well, you know what? We need to find something to fix this problem. And then he had a, a, a Ishmael through uh, Hagar, and God says, no, 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 that's not my plan. Look, I am managing the entire universe. I can manage your problem. I want to tell you this morning, there is no situation in your life that God cannot manage. If he's managing the sun, and he's managing the moons, and he's managing trillions of stars, God said, I can manage your situation. <laughs> Don't let the devil tell you your problem is too many. That's what God is saying. So you can praise me because your problem is not too many. Not only does he do that, he gathers the waters. I'm right now in verse 7, Psalm 33. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear before the Lord. This is talking about Genesis when God said, let the waters come and they came. And God said, God saw that there's water below and God said there was, there was water above. And then he created the firmament to divide the water above from the water below. And he keeps them there. The Bible says he set a limit so that they can never pass. God can set a limit to any situation in your life. God can set a limit to any situation in your life. That situation cannot overrun you. How come water has not overrun the earth since God said, stay there? Why? Because he is in control and he manages every situation. God says, that's why you can go ahead and praise me even when your situation is out of your hand because it's not out of my hand. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God rules his creation. That's the other reason you can praise God. Sometimes the devil wants you to think that he's in charge. He's telling you, see what I'm doing to you. I slap you on this side and then I hook you with a left jab there. See what I can do? But God says, no, I am in control of your life. Look at it with me right there. Verse 10. Psalm 33. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. See right there. The nations stand for the hidden, the unbelieving group of people. The Bible says God is, is, is letting you know that, look, I created everything, but I still have the final say. The nations may gather and say the Lord is not going to rule over us. But he that sits in the heaven says, I bring their counsel and their plans to nothing. Because I have the final say. And not only that, I now establish my will. In your life, God wants you to know that it doesn't matter what is threatening you. He has the final say. God will not prevent your enemies from making plans. 
He, did, he doesn't prevent the nations from taking cancer. You see, here, listen, when, when you see somebody that doesn't allow other people to plan, it's because they are, they are afraid. They don't have enough power. So we don't let them gather. Don't let them gather because if they come together now, they're going to mess me up. God doesn't do that. God is too much power. He said, go ahead and make your plan. Are you done? So in your life, the storm may be raging. The devil may be harassing you. God says, let him do his worst. Then I will let him know who is in charge. All the noise the devil makes in your life is because God allows him to make the noise. But God says, child, let, leave him alone. Don't pay attention. You stand up and praise me because I'm the one that has the final say. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. Whatever God has determined to do in your life, nobody can stop it. You see, it is the lie of the devil and the pressure that he puts on the children of God that makes children of God go amiss. I don't know how many of us here that maybe the Lord has been telling you, stay calm. I have a counsel. That means I have a purpose for you. Don't let the enemy push you. Don't the, let the enemy frighten you. I have, oh, as he said in, in Jeremiah 29, 11, I, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. They are thoughts of what? Good and not of evil. To give you a hope and a future. Listen, if the first point is God cannot lie, that means that verse is true. So just because the devil is doing all he can, God says, I can allow him to make his plan. I will never keep him from making plans because I'm not afraid of his plan. The cancer of the Lord stands forever. If God is for you, who can be against you? That's why God says, daughter, still get up and praise me. <laughs> if you know that I'm for you, don't look at the situation. Praise me because if I am for you, there is no one that can be against you. That's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. No one can be against you. So God is the ruler of his creation. Satan is not the ruler. Now, Satan might make a lot of noise, but he's not the ruler. The devil can threaten you, but he, know, he knows he's not the ruler. The enemies can make you afraid. God says, don't be afraid, because they are not the rulers. What fear does are very damaging. The things that fear does, one, it cripples a child of God. The reason many times as children of God we cannot pray anymore is because the devil will bombard our head. And it will, it, will, it, will, it, will play, it will give you a panoramic view of all the problems around you. And by the time it's done, there is no more strength to pray. Because it just lets you know there is no way out. I'm just letting you know because the problem is everywhere. Number two, not only does fear paralyze this one, fear will make you, it will, it will make you insecure. And once you are insecure in your place in God, you begin to doubt God. You begin to doubt the future. You begin to doubt what the outcomes of things are going to be. And when doubt enters into your life, you begin to make alternative plans for yourself. You begin to say, well, I mean, I, I got to look for, fend for myself. And oftentimes, those alternative plans are against the plan of God. And once the devil gets you to make that alternative plan, he just sits in the corner and laughs. I say, you see that one? She's just cutting a path away from her destiny right now. Why? Because of fear. But God says, no. I am the ruler of the creation. I told the stars where to be. I told the waters where to be. I allow the nations to make their plans. But when I'm done with them, I disarm their plans. You can praise God even in a dark situation because he's still in control of that dark situation. Hallelujah. The last thing I want to share with you today, why you should praise God, is because God monitors all the events on earth and is aware of everyone. He's aware of you. Not only is he aware, he's monitoring your life. It's the devil that makes us Forget that. Look at that verse 15, 13. I'm still in Psalm 33, verse 13 to 15. The Lord looks from heaven. 
This is very important. Verse 13. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees how many? All the sons of men. From the dwelling place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. What this is saying is that God's eyes see you. God is aware of every situation around you. You know why? Because he actually looks from heaven. So God says, when you are in a myriad of problems, God says, I can see you very clearly. When nobody else is seeing the situation, all they see is the nice suit you have on. All they see is the nice bag and shoes that you're carrying. And But you're saying, but nobody knows exactly how I feel. God says, I look and I see. God is aware of every detail of your situation. That's why he said, you can praise me because I'm not ignorant of what you're going through. The devil wants us to believe that God doesn't have the full understanding of our situation. But it's not true. Second Chronicles chapter 16 verse 9. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro. That means, if you can imagine, the eyes of God is going through every part of the world. Including your house. Including your bedroom. And including your heart. And he knows your situation. That's what the Bible says. He knows. Sometimes, when we are alone, we think of all kinds of things. Ten people that day may have asked us, how are you doing? We say, fine. But that doesn't really mean we are doing fine. It's only in the corner of our heart that we know things are not meeting up. At that time, you need to remember, God says, my eyes can see you. I know the circumstances around you. Now, now I can hear somebody say, well, but if God sees me, then how come he's not making a way out for me? Well, here is what I want you to know. The Bible says, when God seemed to be delaying a deliverance or a rescue, to you, it looks like it. But in God's eyes, he's working all things behind the scene together for your good. Hallelujah. When God appears to be holding back on you, he's not holding back. The Bible says he works all things. All things means the good, the bad, and the ugly. God works all of them together for your good. And so God not only sees you, he's working even when you are not aware of it. Let me show you in the scriptures. It's, it's right there in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 37. Let's read it. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Verse 28. Look at verse 28 first. And we know. Everybody say, we know. We know. Oh, if you, if you didn't know, now you are knowing. And we know. What do we know? That all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things means when God is silent, he's still working. When the situations are difficult, God says, it's part of all things. Now, 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 you say, well, 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 how does that work? Well, women, think about it. It works the same way. Do you not know that it's not all the ingredient, cooking ingredients that you use that is sweet? Anybody ever ate raw dark chocolate before? It's bitter. Right? Anybody just gob up vinegar before? Can you really do it? Dandelion, you know, fruit, I mean, uh, flour or whatever, can you just put it in your mouth? No. Why? They are bitter, they are sour, but when they get into the hand of a good cook, good chef, right? And they put the vinegar there and they add the dandelions and do all these things and some really nice dark chocolate. What comes out? 
a beautiful meal. Why? So that person has added the bitter and the sweet and everything together, and they've made a delicious meal. At the end, the product, everybody wants it. But if you take out the individual ingredients, it's not everything that you can eat by itself. God says that's exactly. You have to understand that God is the heavenly cook. He will take the sour, he will take the bitter, he will take the hard one and the sweet ones of your life. He said, if you love me, trust me when I'm done cooking, it's going to be good. And so, God sees the silent period of your life. And he tells you the same way when you are in your kitchen, if you know what you're doing, when you're done, the whole house is going to be smelling good. God says, when he's done with his plan and purpose in your life, if you can wait for him, if you can hold on to him, the end result is going to be great. God works all things together at the end for good of those who love him. The problem is that when the, you are going through the bitter, the devil wants you to quit. The problem is when you are going through the sour, the devil wants you to think that there is nothing else God is doing. Say, this is all you're going to get. But God is telling you that my eyes see all men and I know their situation and I know what to do. Well, how would you feel, women, if you are in, in your kitchen and you have all these ingredients and you, you have a great recipe? And part of them are these things you really cannot. Do you, how many of us can really actually put a, a, a scoop of salt and just eat it? You can. But can you cook without it? No, you can't. That is what happens. God says, if you in your kitchen know how to mix everything together and it comes out good, God is saying, if you can trust me with your life, I will mix the sorrow with the joy and with the sad and the happy. At the end, it's going to be good. So even when it's difficult, you can still praise him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When you kneel down and everything is by, say, God, I know the Bible says you walk all things together. Even the challenges I'm going through right now that I cannot explain is part of what you are working together. Even right now that it appears that you are not answering me, your word, oh, we started with the fact that he cannot lie. Your word tells me that you know how to work it together. Even when the devil is, oh, you know, Joseph said after many years, 13 years later, he said, you meant it for evil, but what happened? God meant it for good. If you had not sold me to Egypt, I would not be here to save the lives of many, including your life today. Some places you will never get to except God allow you to go through the valley and the dry place. So don't be in a hurry to always jump out of the valley. God said, settle down. I am in control of everything. But the devil says, jump out. I will make an exit for you. The moment you take that exit, you have exited out of the plan of God. So, in conclusion today, if you, if you have stopped praising God, God says, go and get your praise back because I have not changed. If you say, well, I'll praise you when the situation changes, God says, it means you don't know me. If the devil is telling you that God is about to let you down, God says it's because you, have not, you are listening to the wrong person. Who have you been listening to in your life? This is the word of God. Let's rise up on our feet. Hallelujah. I want you to just lift up your hand and say, Lord, I praise you because of who you are. Regardless of any situation, I just want you to just give God free praise right now. Because he's a faithful God. Give him praise. Lord, I praise you because your word is true. Because you are God and you are not a man and you cannot lie. Lord, I praise you because you are in control of my life. Every detail, every circumstance, every situation. Lord, I praise you, oh God, because whatever you have said you will do, you are going to do. Lord, I praise you because you have a plan and a purpose.